the Triathlon Show from NO59. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I'll republish an episode where I was interviewed by Colin Moore for the Empirical Cycling Podcast a month or so ago. Many of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with the Empirical Cycling Podcast, and if you're not, be sure to check it out. Uh, Colin is uh, fantastic at going really deep in, into topics and explaining the rationale behind his coaching methods at a level that very few people do. Uh, and But in this interview, we stay a bit more high level, covering a, a very wide range of topics from coaching to podcasting to triathlon training specifics and even some perspectives on current events at the top of the sport in short course and long course triathlon. The interview starts uh, straight away. Uh, we jump right into a discussion without much of an introduction and we discuss how we uh, how, how we as coaches evolve and improve over time. Uh, so be aware that this is the interview in its entirety. Nothing is, is left out. This is just how, how we started it. Uh, but before we get into the interview, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Fuel and Hydration, uh, that create sports nutrition products, including fueling and hydration products. And they help to use these products effectively through a range of free tools, services, and content. They have recently launched a fantastic fuel and hydration planner on their website. This is a one-stop shop for figuring out an effective race hydration and fueling strategy for you. It's free and super easy to use. It only takes a couple of minutes to answer a handful of questions and then you get a detailed, simple and effective race plan. They also offer free video video consultations. As a listener of the podcast, you can get 15% off your order of their electrolyte and carbohydrate products by using the code TTS22 at checkout on precisionfuelandhydration.com. And thank you to Roka. Roka produce exceptional quality triathlon wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, performance sunglasses, and prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses. If you want to go faster in the water, then look to Roka's range of wetsuits. From the entry level to the top of the line wetsuits, all of them come with arm sub technology and exceptional quality and comfort in the water. Roka's tri suits work perfectly together with their wetsuits as they too come with arm sub technology uh, to really ma- maximize your shoulder mobility for the swim. And on the bike and run, the tri suits are optimized for aerodynamics and, aerodynamics and comfort. Roka's range of sunglasses and prescription glasses uh, is also packed with innovation with patented technologies such as the Geeko Anti sleep technology they are ultra light and have excellent optical properties visit roca.com for slash tts for 20 percent off your order now without any further ado here's me being interviewed by colin moore for the empirical cycling podcast so thinking about old training plans uh because i had just looked up one of my old ones and it was the first time i had ever put like one of my long ftp tests into a training plan Um, and I was, uh, I was cringing while reading it and I was like, Oh God. Oh, I did that. Oh God. I told people to do that. Oh God. Um, so when you go back and look at your old plans, do you feel the same way? And also, do you think when you're looking at those plans, I understand why I did that. And now I understand why it's wrong. Yeah. Probably both of those. Uh, I mean, it, uh, yeah, I, I think I think that the the principles of training haven't really changed, but it's more like there are so many kind of nuances that you understand better now than you did then, and and I think I guess almost effectiveness uh, tricks. Like I th- I think that the training is much more <laughs> effective the way I prescribe it now than it was five years ago. So um, so yeah, I mean yeah. I think I think you don't even have to go back five years. You have to go back one year, and, and you you already start to feel a little bit that <laughs> oh, I wouldn't do this uh, like that. And yeah, I think I think it's easy as a coach uh, to be very self-critical, and uh, I certainly am. And, and yeah, it's it's difficult sometimes, but um, yeah, I, I think it's also a good uh, a good thing. It kind of um, to to remember just how far. Yeah, how how much how hard you worked to improve on things and and how far you've come because there it's also you see it kind of in the industry that not everybody works hard to improve their understanding like some people just do the same thing year in year out so so I think there's uh, there's two sides to that coin. Do you think that um, being self-critical is might be one of the most important parts of coaching? 
Yeah, I've, I've, I would say so. I, I think so because it's. I think it's a profession and a, a task that that is going to be bound to be influenced by a lot of potential biases. And and I think that's that's one of the I think critical thinking. That's one a thing that I'm very passionate about in general. And uh, and I think it's something that should be taught in taught in school uh, and uh, especially these days. Um, but yeah, even. Uh, when I went to school, like I, I wish we had had some of that. But I, th- I think being able to understand different, different. Sorry, I'm going to turn off these notifications that are <laughs> coming through. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I think I think that having um, having the understanding of different biases that might occur, you're never going to be able to completely put them aside. But at least understanding them, uh, that's going to to make you a better a, a better coach that's going and and being able to question your own reasoning that's that's going to to make you a better coach so i think being self critical it kind of goes hand in hand with those other attributes that i think are are really important well cuz you went to school for engineering right and so like in engineering um i know engineering is not exactly the same as you know being trained as a proper research scientist but um you learn the scientific method uh, and I know in engineering, like there's an answer because you have to have a product or, or you have to have something at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, I think in the scientific method, that should be self-doubt enough in itself because you're always trying to figure out, oh, what what could have confounded my research result? Um, well, maybe not enough people think of that kind of stuff. And so there's still that human element, you know? Um, and so I think when it comes to self-doubt as coaches, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm sure you're a lot like me in a way, but I, I have heard a lot of stories about people who, you know, not, not to name names as we never do here, but who think they're the shit because their athlete won this, that, or the other thing. And they're like, yeah, now I, everything I do is awesome. Just, you know, my plans are great. I know everything. Um, I, I'm the best coach in the world. Uh, but you know, I think people like you and me, even when somebody wins something, we go, what could we have done better? Yeah, no, I think, I think you have to, uh, you have to have that mindset of, of what, what can you do better? Because otherwise you just, you, you won't improve and somebody else will improve and then, then you're done. So yeah, I think it's, it's pretty self-evident. I mean, it's not self-evident because uh, you do see a lot of circulation, I guess, of, um, you know, the, the same, jobs go into the same circle of coaches they just seem to flip countries every now and then in in, <laughs> in for example in, in triathlon in the in the federation world uh but um, um but yeah i think i think by and large uh i completely agree with that uh is that one of the reasons you started your podcast so that way you had an excuse to interview people all the time and and learn oh 100 percent. yeah that was the main that was the main reason <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah, I was just fascinated uh, by um, learning, but yeah, I've, I've I found that you know there's there's just so much nuance that you can't uh, you can't get from reading somebody's book or watching somebody's video and also uh, reading somebody's research paper. Like you, uh, yeah, the, the best. I I still think I I do all of those things, of course, but the the way that I learn the most is by having a conversation with somebody. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things to me about you and your podcast is what effect does having you know hundreds or maybe are you up to a thousand yet um no but maybe 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 over 500 because i have a lot of unnumbered episodes the q and a's and so on so yeah probably over 500 so when you have done that many episodes and you've um interviewed that many people how often do you get something like, Oh, I've got to jump onto this thing. Like, how do you, how do you sort out how many trends or new things that you're going to follow? How many things do you go? I got to wait and see. And how many things do you later think I should have jumped on that right when it happened? Yeah. I kind of have a rule for myself that I should never jump on, uh, on anything until I let at least a month pass from talking to somebody. And if, if a month later, I still think, Oh, that's so exciting. I need to jump on it. Then, then I, at least I have given it some uh, some time. Uh, some time has passed, and I can give it. I have given it some more thought, and then, 
that's uh, that's one i guess uh, safeguard in place for you know just jumping on some bandwagon but but to be honest most often it's uh, it's not that any one person makes me change my ways or anything like that it's more about uh, at at this point especially you know the principles of training are kind of uh, not really changing i mean i'm sure we're pretty much aligned on them and it's more about the nuances and you always try to kind of uh look at them from different perspectives and in different contexts different uh, athlete profiles perhaps and 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 you can can tweak things here and there and but I, I find that that comes organically over time and it's probably influenced by hearing a couple of people say that oh i do this with that type of athlete or i do that with this type of athlete and so on but it's it's not so much that i i hear this one thing that somebody says and i'm like aha i'm gonna use it it's just uh the idea is probably uh put into my brain a little bit and then it uh, it simmers there for a while and then and then somehow i i remember it and 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 try it out and realizing that yeah a couple of people have mentioned this maybe maybe it might work so so it's it happens more organically over time most of the time i would say yeah do you have any conversations with uh with either self-coach people or other coaches who read like a handful of papers on one training methodology and they're like this is the way i will do just this and it's this is going to be the secret to unlocking my full potential like how many of those conversations do you have um yeah how many of those i pr- probably more so a couple of years ago, because I feel like at this point, uh, my podcast is so mature that everybody who has been a listener for a reasonable amount of time know that one coach will have one methodology, another will have another methodology, and they might both have achieved a great success with their athletes. So they, they get, I think everybody's kind of starting to see that, okay, there's not necessarily, there, there is not one right way. There are different uh, ways to skin a cat. And and the same thing with different trends in research and 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 I think to be honest when whenever I have an, an academic on that uh, that I'm interviewing on a certain topic, be it for example fasted training, which was a big trend a while back, and and uh, yeah, you, I, at that point I did have quite quite a lot of emails around that specific topic, but then uh, more and more research started coming out that well there are some signaling advantages but we don't really see it translating into performance and then on the practical side practitioners start to see that oh actually a lot of these people might uh, have a tendency to end up in a red s situation or even so so there's so so you kind of start to see that it's it's usually not that beneficial to you know jump on jump on a trend it's better to wait until until you get a bit more data and meat on on the bone so to say and not not to answer your to to answer your question more indirectly i was actually read a really interesting article on uh the new yorker yesterday it was sent to me by my sister Uh, it was about uh how uh different biases affect us and about some some experiments that stanford researchers had done on people with confirmation bias and and uh, i'll try to look it up and send it to you so you can put it in the show notes because it was absolutely fascinating stuff they're about how our, our brains and our biases work work against us in in these kind of things. So, so yeah, that was that was a really interesting read that I had just yesterday. Yeah, I mean, because I was I was talking to somebody yesterday uh, about the Watson selection task, um, which is the one where you've got like it's like a um, it's like a vowel, a consonant, a, an even number, and an odd number, and you're supposed to flip over two cards to show that on the back of every vowel is an even number or something like that. You can rearrange it however you want. And most people flip over like the the vowel and the consonant or something like that. And what you should do is you flip over one to um to either to look at if you can confirm this, but you should also flip over like um you know the opposite one on the other side. Like so if you're supposed to look at, you know, on the back of every you know vowel is an even number, over here you flip over the odd number to see if you can confirm or deny that rule exists. And so I think when it comes to the kind of stuff that, you know, we are exposed to as podcast hosts, um, do you ever wonder has, you know, have I developed a small echo chamber of my own podcast listeners? Cause I think about that all the time. Um, I try to avoid that by mostly having my guests do the talking and especially now. So it was a year ago 
in July 2021 when I when I transitioned from having two episodes per week, of which one was a solo episode, usually a Q and A episode, and uh, it was just ba- mainly hours, work hours related. Like I uh, and uh, I just didn't have the the time to produce two episodes per week. So, and and the one, as I said. 100% the reason for starting the podcast was to talk to people. So I didn't want to give that one up. So, so I kept the interviews and, and stopped doing the solo episodes for the most part. So, so by doing that, I, I think that it kind of, it should prevent, uh, most of that from happening. Of course, there is a, a possibility that I select, uh, people that I know will have a specific view on things. And I try to, I try to avoid that by, by having people with many different views as long as I, uh, respect their, um, their ability to be what it, whatever it is, good coaches or good academics, um, and mostly those, those are the two types of of people that I tend to interview. So, so I think I, I do my best to mitigate that, to be honest, uh, with with that with an interview based podcast. Well, because I've always really appreciated your interview style, which is you ask a, a good question and then you give that person as much rope as they need to you know either weave a basket or hang themselves, like you, you know you. Like I, it's such a unique style. Well, it's not, it's not unique, unique, but like, you're not like a, a, a news anchor trying to, you know, get a statement out of somebody that's like quotable and can make a headline. You're not like, you're not also interviewing a political candidate where you're trying to have like a gotcha question. Um, you know, you ask people fairly like both, I feel like they're questions that are like both specific and broad at the same time. And it's always fascinated me. How do you research your guests and how do you come up with such good questions where people can go just, you know, on for, you know, two to sometimes like 10 minutes? Yeah. Uh, it, well, I, I think the, the first answer to that question is that it comes back to the fact that I, I'm genuinely curious, uh, in, learning what uh, what my guests have to say about a certain topics so so i think that's that's really important like i i want to i i don't have an interview as an excuse to make my own opinion known I, like that's that's not something that i need um but uh, but really it, it is to to hear what what my guest has to say and uh, and then in terms of the research that depends a lot on what type of guest i'm interviewing so mainly for when i interview an, an academic researcher that there's usually a lot of uh, research on my part involved reading several of their papers and uh, maybe even some introductory papers to the the area that they're focused on and and so on so so that can be many hours of work to prepare for that and and of course to come up with the with the questions when, when it's a coach it's completely different it especially now uh, that I've interviewed so many I I kind of have a routine where I know a certain set of questions that I, I tend to always like to ask, or at least very regularly like to ask. Uh, I do all, also uh, always like to ask my guests if they have a specific area that they would like to talk to, that they feel like they are uh, experts in or that they feel would be uh, interesting for the audience. Quite often my guests uh, ha- happen to be podcast listeners. I, I never know that beforehand, before I contact them, but then they say, oh, I listen to your podcast. And and then they might know that, well, one thing that you haven't really discussed in your podcast is this, and, and I have some thoughts on that. So then I'm usually saying, great, let's uh, let's have a chat about that topic. So so it's also a bit of a collaborative process, especially with when when there are other coaches that I'm uh, that I'm interviewing. But but again, there are some questions that I think, uh, especially now, I have uh, uh, quite a long long time of doing these interviews that I feel are usually really good questions. Mm. And then, of course, I, I do do my due diligence on the coaches as well to know a little bit about their background as much as I can find out anyway. And, and in some cases, let's say it's a coach that has worked with some very famous or high-level triathletes, then I tend to try to ask about these athletes and their training methods and so on to to get some specifics all, although i also want to be careful about not doing too much about that because we both know that a coach has a certain part to play in an athlete's success but uh, a lot of it is also down to the athlete so we shouldn't <laughs> look too much into what one athlete has done as, as the, the recipe for success and and secondly i also want to have a certain respect for for the privacy of, of the athlete. So, um, so try to find a balance there. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Cause that makes me think, um, you know, cause I, I'm sure you and I are on the same page about this. 
Um, cause a lot of the time when it comes to the training of the top level athletes, um, you know, I've, uh, I, I always think about what, uh, Dean Gollett said to me a long time ago. It's like, just don't screw it up. You know, it's like, like they're this good. You can mess this up because you're steering the ship. But, um, if you, if you're fine, they're going to be fine. Um, and so is that something that you've seen kind of hold true or, um, or do you see some coaches can really get that extra, like one or 2% out of people? Yeah, I think some people can, but it also has to be with the right athlete. So, I, I mean, I think, I think a great example of, of that in the last few years in the triathlon world has been the, the Norwegian triathletes. Uh, it's, it's the obvious example. Um, but it's not to say that their methods, I, I, I honestly don't think that their methods would work with, uh, with every triathlete. Like it's not, they might, I'm sure there are athletes that are equally talented as they are, but if you, put them in the same environment and, and the same training methods, then that might not work for them. So, and, and it's, I don't know, it's, I, of course the coaches could change the, the training methods potentially to make those other equally talented athletes equally successful. But what I'm saying is that it, it's also a question of be, of having, of having the right coach athlete relationship, not just the right coach or the right athlete. It has to be a match uh, on, on both sides, if that makes sense. Oh, it totally does. Um, you know, cause I've, I've experienced that where, you know, me and some people, we just don't work well together. Like the communication isn't quite there. Uh, you know, they'll write workout comments and I'm just like, I don't understand what this guy's trying to tell me <laughs> with this sentence. Um, yeah. and you know, to him, it might be like lingo he uses with his friends or something like that. And I, I don't understand. And I'm, tr- and I don't want to be rude also when I try to ask for clarification and at some point you just realize that you're you're just button heads and nothing good is going to come up, come of this. And, you know, when you part ways, um, I mean, I, I know some, uh, some newer coaches and especially when I was young and coaching, uh, you know, part of it would be like, Oh man, that's, that's like a substantial portion of my income gone, (laughs) but also like there's this relief. Um, and okay, now I can try to find somebody who's going to be a better fit. Like, you know, it, you know, there's a, there's a, it's just business kind of aspect to that kind of thing too. Yeah. I think I definitely, yeah. Uh, recognize that. I, I completely agree. Like it's at, at the, in the early days, like it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really horrible because yeah, you don't know how you're going to, going to have food on the table for the next month, but then, <laughs> yeah. uh, but then at some point, uh, hopefully if things go well, then you get to a point where, yeah, it's just, it's it's a good thing on all parts because you get a chance to have a an athlete that is a better fit for you and and it 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 weighs on you even if you don't really think about it but when 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 you then part ways and you hopefully get an athlete that is a better fit for you then then you just start to realize how much that pressure has been weighing on you of having somebody who doesn't really who you don't really work well together with because that does happen for everybody I'm sure yeah yeah it's like that I I notice like when I dread opening up that person's training piece. Cause a lot of the time it's somebody who's inconsistent. Um, cause I think one of the things that's nice about what we do is that, especially in our sports, um, our athletes are intrinsically motivated to a very high degree. And a lot of the time our job is to get them to train less or go less hard. Like, Hey, pull it back on this ride. Cause you know, you've got to be this, that, and the other thing down the road. Um, as opposed to, Hey, you know, texting somebody, did you get your bike today? <laughs> we don't have to do yeah. that a lot of the time, thankfully. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And and for me, uh, that's definitely the the kind of athlete that I that I don't work really well with when if I have to be the motivator, like that's not something that I'm I'm good at <laughs> at all or or even like doing very much. So so yeah, I'm I'm not going to be a good coach for for that for the kind of athlete that needs actual motivation some athletes just need to have a coach and then that's enough accountability for them to be consistent and then that's fine but if they if they need additional specific external motivation from the coach then yeah that's not something that i enjoy or i'm good at doing yeah yeah like, and we have a couple coaches and I'm, I'm sure you've got a couple assistant coaches too where they're way better at that and i and when people are you know sending in coaching inquiries like what kind of coaching relationship do you need here uh and Based on what they say, uh, you know, it whittles down the choices pretty quickly and easily. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so 
with your podcast, I I'm sorry, like it's it's this is so much fun to you know the interviewer is now the guest and I get to ask you questions. Um, when when you've interviewed so many people, and you because uh, you are probably one of the people on Earth who has the most knowledge about what the most cutting edge stuff is and like the most new research, like you've got probably like you've got the widest net cast. Um, and so you're probably aware of way more tools than a lot of people, including especially me, because I've got my head down in like three areas of research and that's it. Um, so when you've got a lot of tools in your toolbox to reach for, um, does having such a big selection have any difficulties in itself? Or is it like your core principles of training are pretty well conceived by this point and you just reach for things when something it becomes an issue yeah that that's a broad question but largely i would say that your uh that what you said there the the latter option is correct that the the basic principles are well conceived and then there are tools that can uh that can be helpful there are of course a certain certain tools that that's might be useful for everybody within those basic principles but but a lot of things are things that you kind of reach for in cases when you have we're having issues or maybe you need to look for the one percenters or or something something like that but but it's not useful for the majority of athletes necessarily and and again like i look at this try to look at this from um with some uh critical thinking uh skills uh on me and and it's of course difficult and you don't always get it get it right but i I try to use things myself before as well before uh imposing anything on on my athlete so trying out things there are a couple things that i'm trying out at the moment and uh uh, without i mean a couple of things that i i can i can tell that i'm that i'm experimenting with now is uh, aero testing i'm i've been experimenting with the no show uh aero sensor uh being guided by actually a, a friend of mine who is a, an expert in aerodynamics and a cyclist himself uh and also another is is an app related to uh readiness but not just the normal hrv but things like cognitive fatigue and so on so um so yeah i mean i'm always trying to experiment with different things and and that also gives me kind of that uh, that time that I talked about earlier before deciding if um, if I think this is something that I can have as a toolbox to reach for with some or even all of my athletes and and uh, but I think for example with the aero testing thing the sensor is nice but what we've found as well is that if you have a I have access to an outdoor velodrome um, which is you know, basically like just like a um, a, a, a concrete track for cycling I, it's, I mean it's it's flattering to call it a velodrome almost but but it's still it's good enough it, it gets the job done uh and uh and and we found out that yeah we can probably do error testing with a reliability of one percent without uh any any other sensors than a gps sensor and a power meter so just, just based uh, on speed right yeah so so it also gets um yeah testing different tools also kind of gets you thinking about different options that you have and and you can often find that well you can whittle things down to being more simpler than than they seem to be at first uh, potentially so mm-hmm. i don't know if that answers your question completely but at least it gave you some thoughts for <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you you seem to have a lot of very similar thought process to processes to to me in that a lot of the time there is no definitive answer to uh you know especially like the broad questions that i'm asking you so um but i you know I think a lot of the time when you get when you ask a question that has a definitive answer, uh, it is a very niche question, um, and so you know a lot of the time it comes down to you know that kind of detail stuff, um, you know like individualizing things for the athlete. Like what is this person's specific issue? Like if they're not sleeping well, um, you know getting them you know to have a sleep routine or something like that, or if their nutrition is a problem, having having them consult with a nutritionist and things like that because like. That's not something that everybody needs, uh, but it's something that some people need. And it actually reminds me along those lines, um, do you ever get clients who, because of the nature of your podcast, because we get these occasionally, 
um, where they expect a lot more. They, they expect you to like ride with like eight different sensors and go to the lab and get tests like once a month and stuff like that. Like, does that ever happen? Oh uh, yeah, it has, it has happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and I try to, especially maybe in the early days, uh, that's something that I, I learned from early day mistakes. Uh, but these days, um, I try to make it very clear kind of what, what my coaching is like and what our coaching is like in general, because, uh, all, all of us across scientific triathlon are pretty similar in that sense and pretty pragmatic and practical that look, there are all these cool tools, but, but still like the basics is the, is 98% of, uh, of what it is to training. So, so no, you're not going to have eight sensors on you for most of your workouts and, uh, no, we're probably not going to write your workouts into these fancy AI app or whatever, so that you can do it, uh, based on <laughs> you do your AI training or whatever it might be. Uh, so yeah, I think basically having setting the expectations right from the beginning, and and if if the athlete is not okay with that, then that's that's absolutely fine. That's their prerogative. But uh, but yeah, I, I think I learned from mistakes early on that because that then didn't pan out very very well if they had those expectations, and that's not the way that I coach or one, another one of our coaches coach. And so yeah, setting the expectations right from the beginning is uh, is really important in in that scenario as well as in, in all other scenarios uh, really that you could have. Yeah. Um, I completely agree. So I just want to ask you just a couple more questions on the, the podcasting front. Um, so, you know, in the podcast, um, you know, you're always looking at the scientific literature and, you know, when you do research on a, a researcher um, or, you know, you're looking at, you know, interviews that have been done with a coach that you're going to have on or, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, do you feel like there's a, a large gap or a small gap or like, where do you think the relationship is between most athletes and coaches and the scientific literature? Oh, that's a great question. It, it's really hard to say. I think, it, I think it really varies a lot from, um, from coach to coach really. I mean, there's a cultural component. I, I think, um, I, I do have a sense that um, in Europe there is maybe less of a gap. I, I think there is coaches here are, tend to be tend, tend to be quite uh, quite into the science as well as the coaching, and and there is also I guess a a structure, a framework for how coaches and scientists work together within within federations and the like. So so that helps um to to close to bridge that gap basically uh but even within europe i think there are de uh, definite variations from country to country and of course individually from uh from coach to coach uh i'm, I'm a bit less familiar with uh with other countries like the us and canada and australia and, and so on I, I do have a feeling that maybe uh, at least in the triathlon scene there's uh like a little bit of a bigger gap there but at the same time like that's not necessarily a bad thing because um i mean i i think that coaching is probably uh, ahead of research and, and research is just is, is quite often trying to prove the methods that coaches have found out <laughs> quite uh, years ago are, are all are working so 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 it's not always a bad thing i think i think that a good coach doesn't have to have a great understanding of and the scientific literature i think it in some cases it can help and i think that the it's more about the mindset really like it's i think a good coach has to be curious and be open minded but they can be that that can take many different shapes it 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 doesn't have to be that they have to read research paper it it can be that they're just really expressing that in different ways and and channeling that energy into being very um be, be be assessing their own methods and how they are working in different ways uh if that makes sense yeah, it does. Um, well, and you say something that I find fascinating because I agree with you in that um, a lot of, you know, you're saying a lot of scientific research uh, is trying to catch up to coaching. Because um, I think it's very interesting that because I know a lot of people who think, you know, unless something's been published, it's not scientifically valid and it doesn't work or something like that. And it's like, you know, two plus two was four before, you know, Euler published a paper on it. Like it, it's, 
you know, there are, I think, certain observations that we can make as coaches where, um, you know, the scientific literature does need to catch up. And, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm just fascinated in general by the, the relationship between the two, because I think a lot of researchers are missing that like critical, you know, component of how does this change what we're doing in practice. And a lot of coaches will look at the literature and try to put that into practice and go, this works, this doesn't work. And, um, I, I think a lot of the, uh, like our general audience who is more into the research, um, you know, may not be as aware of that dynamic as we are. And maybe just what we're doing is just trying to bridge that gap. Oh yeah, no, 100%. I agree. And, and, and I think that's maybe what, what we can contribute with, especially is, well, first of all, when, well, and that's something that I try to do when I interview uh, researchers trying to uh, ask about the applied side of things. So how, how to apply this. And, and that's where I also uh, try to maybe express my own opinion a little bit about how, how I might apply that, but also asking about limitations of the research. And, and I think, and asking about, okay, this, here's this cool researcher that has this done this really cool study, but is this the only one in the field or what has come before it and what has come after it? Uh, asking about what the general state of the evidence is, not just this one paper that, that had this interesting result. So, so I think uh, there are a couple of ways that, that podcasters and other media can, can do a good, a good or a better job about, um, conveying that sort of information to, to the audience. Yeah. Like, like I love it when an article or just something links a paper and I, and I'm seeing it more now, but it's only like a rate of like 40% at most where like they're, they'll talk about this researcher and there's paper and I'm like, all right, how do I, where's the PubMed reference? I, I want to go find this paper and read it. And I, I can't. Um, and it's, I'm sure, I'm sure it annoys you as much as me as a lot of the listeners. Um, but you know, when it comes to that kind of stuff, you know, do you have any guests who are like white whales for you? Is there anybody you really want to interview and you've just not been able to make it happen or you've been like intimidated? Cause you know, I've been intimidated uh, by the list of guests I've got. I'm like, Oh man, is, is Ed Coyle still alive? Can I talk to him? Oh God, what do I ask? Him? I'm so excited. Well, I'm glad you asked this question actually, because if there's somebody that uh, knows these people, then they might be able to to help me yeah. get to them. I have tr I have tried to contact. Uh, there are a couple of coaches that I still uh, that I have wanted to interview for a long time, and I haven't been able to uh, to reach them or uh, get get them to want to come on. So, uh, in, and and they are triathlon coach. Well, one triathlon, one cycling cycling slash triathlon coach. So Julie Dibbons uh british uh coach based in in boulder and tim carrison who was with team sky for a long time but is also the coach of cam uh who of course is doing a lot of triathlon in addition to his uh cycling so so those are two coaches that i that i would love to into i find that they're on the academic side most people generally seem to be very happy to come on like it's uh, i honestly i can't remember off the top of my head uh, an example of somebody that hasn't wanted to come on and and even on the on the coaching side other than that like uh, honestly uh, most or all of the coaches that i've really wanted to interview i i have been able to to get on the podcast so um i mean a couple of uh coaches that at, at the time felt like wow this is this is really big uh, was uh the first one i think was when i interviewed malcolm brown who was the coach of the Brownlee brothers, and and that was fairly early on in the podcast days, uh, no less. So so that was that was really amazing, and uh, Dan Lorang um, with Woodhans Croy, but uh, perhaps even more famous for coaching Alfredino and Anne Haug, and and now also Lucy Charles Barclay, and uh, and also Adil Tveit and the uh, uh, Norwegian coach who who has kind of been involved from the start with uh, the Norwegian setup and and produced uh, the triathletes to the level they are today so so those are a few that were I think big big felt like big moments for me I'm I'm trying to I, I'm, I'm trying to put that look on my face like I'm impressed but I've never heard of these people so <laughs> <laughs> except for uh, unless I've listened to the to their episodes on your podcast um because I still do that. I should, I should, I should, I should, I should, I should have add Joel Filial to that list as well. That that was a really big moment for me. Mm, yeah. Um, well, so now I want to dig into some triathlon stuff. Um, actually, hold on. Before I do that, uh, 
here's a question that I've I have down for Andy Coggin um, when I talk to him in a couple of weeks, but uh, I'll ask you now. Um, do you think that well, because like when you see a researcher who publishes something and then makes the rounds in the podcasts, um, you know, to promote it, um, you know, what do you think is behind that? Because obviously, like you know, they're not making money on this kind of stuff. Um, you know, going out and talking about the research is it? Do you think it's like a genuine? desire to help the greater community by saying this is what we found and this is our recommendations for what you should do to help xyz or um do you think there's something else to it um yeah i'm trying to remember when i've seen that like um and uh well, I'm yeah thinking, probably i think especially like like uh because like keith barr steven seiler uh you know guys like that yeah. like they they make the rounds like if you google keith barr that's b-a-a-r on on like itunes you're gonna get like 20 or 30 podcasts with him yeah is he in resistance training or what is his area he's uh oh man boy what is his area <laughs> what isn't his area um he's he's done a lot of research on uh aerobic adaptation uh mtor uh and lately he's looking at uh connective tissue and muscles and ligaments and tendons hmm. so yeah a lot of stuff i i mean i think yeah in the case of steven seiler for example i i i don't think that he's necessarily been putting himself out there for all these podcasts i think he has just been somebody that has been popular for podcasts to get on and of course uh, i also include him and and want to get him on at some point he he's he's a great researcher uh, i think with with some really great ideas um and uh but yeah, I think I think he it's he he has a big name, of course, in uh, in the world of sports science. So so I think I think it honestly I, I'm not sure if it's coming from him. I, I think it's more like some some podcasts keep wanting him back on the on the podcast. So and that's that that's fine, I guess. And I think for my I can only speak from my side, but I haven't really had researchers that reach out to me that hey I published this article. What I what I do have is sometimes is a lot of outreach for people that have published books. And like I got one just today, somebody published a book in diabetes and, uh, and wants to be on the podcast. And to be honest, like, yeah, that's not going to be on my, on my show. So I, I generally want to do most or all of my outreach comes from me, not from the other side. And there is the occasional exception where somebody is genuinely a great candidate and, and they're not necessarily looking to promote, uh, anything of their own. Or if they do, then it's just a side effect of, the great knowledge that they can impart on the audience, but I, I think with academic researcher researchers, it's it's more like the maybe, and I have done that certainly. I've heard somebody on a on a different podcast, and I'm like, oh wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. And then I ask them, hey, do you want to come on my <laughs> yeah. podcast? And it seems like they're doing a tour, <laughs> but it they, does, they were does, just discovered it? by yeah. Well, because I mean, a guy like Siler, like you listen to him. First of all, his accent's great. It, it yeah. is <laughs> it's a, it's a phenomenal Texan accent. Um, and he's a really good speaker and, you know, when he gives you advice on like, you know, you've got to, you know, make sure you're recovering and like all, you know, sleeping well and eating well and all that kind of stuff. Like, I'm like, man, more people need to hear this kind of stuff. <laughs> like, you know, polarized or not, like everything else is like, oh man, like, yeah, get him out on more podcasts to talk about that stuff. Uh, cause it makes such a big difference. Um, so now I want to ask you about triathlon specific stuff because, um, I used to coach running a little bit and we have a couple triathlon coaches with us, but, um, there's a bunch of stuff I want to ask you about that, um, my cycling focused audience is always kind of like, you know, we're tri curious about, um, like how do you manage intensity between sports and like managing the different types of intensity and like, you know, the cycling, obviously like large metabolic component, you can go through a lot of kilojoules, like running very high muscular load, like mechanical loads, swimming, different muscle group. It's in the shoulders. Like, um, does this affect, you know, how you like assign like brick workouts or do you like, is there like a general kind of periodization that kind of like balances all this stuff how do you how, like how do you balance it in in the athlete 
Yeah, uh, that, that's. I mean, I think it's one of the key Another questions very broad in, question in triathlon. Too, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's no, it's fine. It's it's fine. I I think there are a few things that. I, for, first of all, uh, I should say that it it really does make triathlon different than say running or cycling. Like I would coach a cyclist or a runner different than a triathlete for this reason that you're training three different disciplines and and you are doing some hard workouts in all of those three disciplines so you just end up having more frequent hard workouts um and but then the intensity management part of it for me at least in in my approach becomes first of all the the low intensity training is usually really really easy like i i I don't prescribe a lot of zone two training it's zone one i don't necessarily prescribe it like that but quite often it's honestly just an rpe like this should feel like an rpe of two to three and uh it doesn't matter whether it's a run or a bike or a or a swim like that's that's the prescription and uh so so the easy training becomes really easy to uh to make sure that that's not too costly considering that you then have more frequent hard workouts as a triathlete than you would have as a cyclist or a runner. But then when it comes to the hard workouts, um, the, the way that I manage that is to, to also have keep, keep them a bit more conservative than I would for a cyclist, especially for a cyclist, for a runner, I would probably still do the same just because of the load bearing aspect. But, but, but by that, I mean that, that I always want my athlete to feel like they, they could have done more and quite often quite a bit more uh, if if they had wanted to. Like they they were not at the limit, like RPE for session RPE, maybe a seven or maybe an eight uh, or so. And, and feeling like they had, let's say they're doing something like uh, five times, f- five times eight minutes on, on the bike or something, with, something with two minutes recovery. And then, then, then I wanted to feel like, yeah, I could have done one to two intervals more uh, without without it being going to the well. Like that, that's kind of what, uh, what what I want them to feel. So, so basically, managing the stress that each individual workout has in in that way as well, and and then and and then still trying to get in, even though you have frequent hard workouts, trying to get in uh, a couple of days that are uh low load so so for example it might be that a monday that is just an easy swim or or a complete rest day and a friday that might be an an easy swim and an easy bike uh so so it's com- a completely low intensity day because then you might have uh an intense or moderate intense workout on all the other days of the week potentially mm. so and obviously that depends like with a more beginner athlete you don't have that same amount of frequent intensity but with with more advanced athletes yeah you do you can easily have two hard bikes swims and runs in a week if you distribute things properly and and manage those other aspects and um how much of those um harder rides are targeted at a physiological intensity and how many of them are targeted at race pace because this is something that i would assume you know, when you're looking at running, riding, swimming, um, you're thinking, you know, early season, you're thinking, what are the, our general adaptations that we need general aerobic adaptations, like, you know, or, you know, structural adaptations for like running or technique for swimming. And then do you get, you get more specific towards triathlon specific pace later. Like if somebody's doing a, like a sprint try or an Olympic distance or a, you know, half iron or whatever it is, like, is, is that kind of how it works? Cause that's how I assume yeah. it would work. Exactly. But I could no, be that's, wrong that's on this exactly stuff. Right. Cause <laughs> well, cause I think one of the things that, um, that, you know, you had mentioned on your podcast with Matt Darash on the oxidative potential podcast, which was a phenomenal conversation, by the way, I absolutely loved it. You guys did a great job. Um, you were talking about, you know, feeling nervous about how you're approaching some swim workouts now. Um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. So, so ba- basically, yeah, the discussion was that I'm approaching swim training. It's not so much being nervous. I, I think, I think that I <laughs> honestly, maybe I'm too confident in, <laughs> in being right here, but, <laughs> but, but, but I do think that, um, in triathlon, we traditionally treat swimming or we, we train swimming like pool swimmers do, but that's very different from the way that you would, uh, that, that a traditional endurance cyclist or endurance runner would train. So you don't have your long endurance workouts necessarily, or you break it up into short intervals that are often 
a swarm at steady intensity, which might honestly, if you measure lactate, it might be quite high. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and then in your hard workouts, you the work to rest ratios are completely off compared to what you would do in in a, a bike or run workout. Um, they are called a certain thing more so based on the total distance and uh, the work to rest ratio rather than the actual intensity. But in in a lot of cases, swim workouts are basically best effort for the set. And I think. That's something that can be particularly dangerous in triathlon for the reasons that, that I discussed earlier, that I want each workout to feel like, yeah, there's quite a bit left in the tank, or at least a bit left in the tank at the end of the workout. So, so, so yeah, it's not so much me being nervous. It's more taking a different approach to swimming, I guess, and, and, and programming it a bit more that like swimming, sorry, like running and, and cycling. So having traditional endurance swims that are really easy swims with long duration intervals and the rests are just there for uh, a mental rest and for uh, the listeners that might not be at all familiar with swimming uh, the way that you would do traditionally maybe do an endurance swim in, uh, in swimming is not that you would go out and swim for an hour like you would for a run or for a bike or bike it might be two or three hours but but for a swim it's still you you traditionally always break up the swim into intervals because otherwise athletes get so bored uh just following the back, black line in the pool but 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 it can backfire because then if you do something like 40 times 100 with 10 second recoveries uh after each 100 and you might swim the 100 in one minute 30 then it basically makes it quite easy for the athlete to swim at what we might call a, a tempo effort and and it still feels very easy because you're only doing it for a minute and 30 seconds and then you get 10 seconds rest and and your heart rate drops down quite a bit because it's passive rest it's relatively cold in the water and so on you have the hydrostatic pressure as well uh so so that, so that uh yeah so 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 for all of those reasons it's quite easy to swim way too hard in your easy swims and in your hard swims and that's where yeah change changing approach to swimming i think comes from and it's, it's not something new exactly but it's something that i'm uh yeah i'm more cognizant of and and i guess going more all in on these days i would say than than i used to do a year or so ago yeah well because i think well when i say nervous i because i was detecting trepidation with breaking from tradition because yeah i, I think we all feel that way when you know we tr- we decide to try a new training method or a new testing method or whatever it is where, you know, this, we know that this has not been done before to our knowledge and based on our experience and first principles, it should work, but you know, people have gotten pretty fast without doing this. And what makes us think that we're special? Like, you know, you and I, like, we're just average guys, like, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. But, but that said, I mean, I, I absolutely don't want to take credit for, for this because it has been done by, by other people as well. And only in the last couple of months, there has been at least two guests on my podcast that have talked about swim training in, in uh, at least some of these aspects have been very similar to what I'm doing. So I'm uh, recalling right now Bex Milnes and uh, Tim Reed both expressed similar things about how they approach swim training. So so I'm not taking credit for, oh, I discovered this thing. That, that, that's not at all what, what I'm saying. But, I, but I, I do think that it's a bit of a break with tradition, as you say. And, and there are a lot fewer people doing that kind of swim training than what traditional uh, swimming looks like. Yeah. Well, because I remember back in the day, I, I coached a couple of runners, uh, uh, one for duathlon and one for triathlon. And um, and the triathlete, uh, one of them was uh, actually doing a marathon. Uh, that was like her main training. And I didn't know much about traditional running training, but I knew cycling training and I just took what I knew about cycling training and what I knew about running like the mechanical wear and tear and all that. And I basically had her doing extensive threshold intervals, like, you know, longer threshold, longer kind of sweet spot stuff. And, you know, she PR'd her marathon by, you know, I think, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's like, it was like five or seven minutes or something like that. Like, um, you know, it's not like, you know, 20 minutes, but it was, you know, not insubstantial. Um, and she was like, oh my God, I feel like this training really worked because, um, you know, in principle, like metabolically, yeah, this should work. And in terms of like running pacing and that kind of stuff, it should work. Um, and it did. I'm not an amazing running coach. I don't, I'm, that's not my favorite thing to coach, but, uh, it, you know, I was like, and I, I remember cause I picked up like Daniel's running formula and I was like, 
oh man, how do I coach running? I've got this runner. <laughs> um, and then I was like, oh, come on. I know how to do this. You know, I don't, I don't care what's been done before. I sh- this should work. Um, and, you know, it didn't not work. I guess. <laughs> yeah, no. And and I think for, first of all, like you you did a great episode on on the extensive threshold work with where you uh covered that Vernick Bilat uh paper where they actually had runners doing that type of that type of work. So so that was really interesting just um yeah, a week or a couple of weeks ago when we recorded yeah, it was this. Like so, two, two so, and a half, something like that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So so that was that was really interesting. And and secondly, I, I actually I just uh went on a run uh, a couple of days ago with a runner friend of mine and uh, and we were chatting quite a lot about run training and marathon training and and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Renato Canova but he's one of the top marathon coaches uh, he's coached a lot of uh, the top Kenyan uh, runners he's Italian but, but I think he's based in, in Kenya and, and his methods are um, yeah very well renowned like they've been written about a lot and he's he's been very gracious with sharing a lot of his his methods and and they are if you compare them to a lot of traditional running methods, which is, you know, uh, maybe something like VO2 max intervals on a Tuesday, uh, a threshold work, which is probably uh, a bit above threshold, five, six millimoles lactate on a Thursday, and, and then a, a long run, maybe with some marathon pace on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, the Canova method is, is quite different in that it's it's a lot more about you know that extensive threshold work. I mean, he, that's not what he calls it, but it, it ends up being more like that. Uh, quite a bit of, you know, marathon pace, run, a lot of marathon pace running, and then some progression runs, and 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 that sort of thing. Like and 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 less of the really fast stuff on on the track that that a lot of other runners are doing. And and that was uh, a discussion we had as well. That in 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 different regions of the world, like in Australia, for example, a lot of the the running uh, the running philosophy comes from a, a generation of runners that were really successful and they did things a certain way and and that's why australians runner now use that same methods generally to train and, and of course the same thing plays out in in many different regions and uh, but but yeah anyway i mean i think it makes total sense that what you what you did there worked uh with with that sort of training i mean i think for for long endurance events like the marathon or for long distance triathlon like it's uh yeah similar approach with uh, just quite quite trying to do quite a lot of that that type of training whatever you want to call it extensive threshold or race specificity uh yeah it i i mean it to me to me at least that's yeah that, that's also a big part of, of my my approach yeah um well let me ask you another thing that i hear about all the time uh in triathlon uh is reverse periodization a real thing um doing yeah, all the harder stuff first like you you know you start with like a little bit of prep work you go right into vo2 max then you do your threshold work then you do your sweet spot work and then you do your you know iron man tempo specific work or something like that yeah um i i don't think it's not a thing i don't think it's a <laughs> panacea uh like it's not going to be uh make a I, I think periodization in general is maybe like yeah it's I I look at it more about uh, looking at looking at this as a gap analysis so where is the athlete now where do they need to go and okay how how do we how do we bridge those gaps that that we have between where they are and where they want to go if if of course analyze assessing if that's even possible in the first place. And in some cases, that's quite straightforward, and in other cases, maybe not. In in some, that's where maybe in some cases we want to bring in bring in some of those special tools. Maybe some athletes we want to send into a lab to see, okay, where is your VO two max and where is your threshold? Do we need to work specifically on VO two max because you're limited there and so on? We can, of course, sometimes make estimations as well. Uh, but um, anyway, I think I think it can work in certain. Um, in certain contexts, for sure, when when we're talking about you have a longer race like an Ironman or half Ironman that you're building towards, and 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 you and you still have an athlete that you know, okay, I want to at some point during this season, I need to get in some VO2 max training with them. Sure, it it makes sense to do it after some. Uh, it can it can make sense to do it after some uh, preparation work, and then you do it. Uh, an advantage of that is that they're quite fresh when they do the VO2 max work, so so that's that's advantageous. Like you know that they can go really hard because those are the kinds of workouts where you really need to go hard, and maybe not just an RP of eight, even for a triathlete. So you might need to go harder than that. So 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 
So it can make sense. Uh, I, I don't think it's something that uh, that you should take as a, you know, this is the way to periodize trading for <laughs> long distance triathletes. Uh, that, that's absolutely not the case in my in my opinion, because yeah, there are, there might be some, uh, or there are definite triathletes that they, they don't even, they don't necessarily need uh, that high intensity training because they are getting their VO2 max development from the volume they're doing. And, and when you do the, the threshold intensity, you also, that's not specific VO2 max development, but the, I, I think it's, I, I, you see VO2 max improvements. It has to come from something. The volume is a big thing, but and I think when you have a little bit of intensity, well, not a little bit, but you have that slightly lower intensity of threshold, for example, that helps uh, when when you combine the aspect of the volume and that intensity that that it can still bring your VO2 max up to a certain level. You you will tap out on that at some point, and and you've done great jobs of explaining your approach to VO2 max training on your podcast. So, and I I think that's really uh yeah really really great uh what what you're doing there but i I think for many athletes they don't need reverse periodization but it it can be it can be a thing interesting um because one of my other questions was you know do triathletes or well now the question is how often do triathletes do those higher intensity workouts like on average and do you ever think about anaerobic capacity with long distance triathletes yeah well this is one of those things where um I can very clearly see my evolution as a triathlon coach that especially when 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 I look at triathletes focus on half and full distance triathlon every year I prescribe less and less high intensity training <laughs> <laughs> for some reason <laughs> so um I I think I think there comes a point when when you need that and and I mean probably all of my athletes will at some point during the year do uh maybe one block of VO2 max training, which can be two weeks. So, so yeah. they will do a, a few sessions there, but, but, but at the same time, I think, I think that you can, when we're talking about amateur athletes that are not at their genetic potential or close to their genetic potential, like you, you can, you don't, you don't need a lot of that. And, and you probably have bigger fishes to fry and, and potentially more room to improve by focusing on, on other aspects of your fitness and your physiology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and going on the other side of things to the low intensity side, do you, do you think that there's a particular sport or do you have a sport preference for recovery activity or, um, you know, is there something that makes sense just in general, in terms of triathlon training where, you know, you should do your recovery rides on your bike or you should do a recovery swim and like avoid running or something like that? Yeah, I like swimming as a recovery modality because then you can still keep the frequency up because swimming is a technical sport so you can still work you can still get the benefit of the technical training there comes a point when you're just too tired to have a good swim your legs just sink because you're so tired Mm. but and and then it's difficult but but i i do but then even then you can use a pool boy uh or 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 a wetsuit or buoyancy shorts and so so there are ways to get around that and still work on your stroke so so i like i like to swim uh the most as a recovery modality at the same time i do like to get in a lot of volume on the bike for so for athletes that are more advanced volume is important to them we try to get in a lot of volume then yeah they will do a lot of uh quality recovery I, I don't i don't really ever put in a workout in training peaks and call it a recovery this or that but but it still forms a relative recovery day for example so so I, th- that might be an easy ride then and, and it can still for an advanced athlete be a two-hour easy ride but mm. um yeah it, it's it's not it's not recovery per se but but i think that you can yeah, you can, you can get in some uh, some easy aerobic work on, on the bike as well. So definitely the, the swim would be the first one and the bike would be the second one. Okay, cool. Now, when, whenever people ask me this question on my Instagram AMAs, I will just refer them to this podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh man, that's great. Um, my, uh, I guess my last question specifically about triathlon is on pacing. Because... Um, uh, you know, I get this question a lot for time trials, like what power can I hold? And my answer is usually, have we done an effort of this duration before that that's going to be our, at this, at this elevation also, and, you know, in the same, you know, heat and humidity and all that, have we done something in the similar conditions? That's going to be our starting point. 
you know, and also what's the difference in your condition between now and then? Were you like peak shape right then and you're not right now or vice versa? Um, and cause whenever people ask me about this kind of stuff, you know, the, the real underlying principle here is the best predictor of performance is performance itself. And I think one thing that is not as well known to a lot of, uh, just, you know, casual cyclists or e- even triathletes maybe, um, is that what people can do under threshold varies quite a bit. Uh, like I've, I've got a lot of, um, you know, world tour data now, and I'm looking at a lot of people with like great, like 20, 30 minute power. And they just like fall off a cliff when it comes out to like three, four hours. And there are others who are the opposite where they're 20, 30 minutes, not that high, but they just do not fatigue and they can just bludgeon you with Watts for like three, four five hours if they want to. Um, and so when it comes to triathlon pacing, uh, how do you approach this? Because I'm sure that there are rules of thumb. Um, oh, you did talk. You talked about this on Matt's podcast. Sorry. Uh, I, was I like, did actually. I swear yeah, to God, I, I just heard I this. And I, I did the yeah. same Google and I went, oh, yeah, that's wrong. That's wrong. Or that's probably wrong. Yeah. Uh, it might be a middle of the road thing. So tell me about your approach to that kind of pacing, like sub threshold. Yeah, it's well. It's very similar to what to what you just said there. Like I, I agree with all of that. Uh, looking at what you've done before, and, uh, and 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 the conditions as well. And and in addition to that, uh, before going into any sort of important race for the athlete, we do race specific workouts and and see. And that that's obviously not doing the entire race. But when you do that in a relatively fatigued state in a training block, when if you do let's say five times twenty minutes at your uh, half Ironman effort and uh, with five minute recoveries on the bike, then that's going to be, in my experience, quite reflective of what you can uh, what you can probably do for the entire race. If you're if you're somebody who does the the bike fairly quickly, let's say in uh, you know two to two and a half hours uh, or the ninety kilometers in the half Ironman, so it's it's close enough in in the total duration that that it can it, it can translate when you're tapered and and in your peak uh peak shape uh of course then you still have to account for conditions if you're going from a temperate climate to to somewhere very hot or that those those or altitude as well so so those mm. those things you do need to to account for but but yeah it's it's looking at past data com- comparing conditions and and looking at recent simulation workouts the, the, those are the the main methods i i go by and yeah i, I would strongly urge people to to not look at those articles because yeah as as you just said that uh, it's it's just so individual and uh, and it, what what i think is that when you look at the triathlon recommendations like 85% of ftp for for half ironman for example that that's true for uh very very f- well trained athletes that um, yeah extremely well trained athletes extremely endurance trained and that are also doing the half Ironman in a fairly short time. So obviously it's a very big difference if you're doing the bike like in two hours versus three hours, then that's going to have an impact. Uh, do you find that somebody's TTE at threshold has a relationship with this or is that, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I guess I assume it does, but to be honest, it's not something that I looked too deeply into. Uh, like I, I don't, uh, do as good a job as you do i'm sure of keeping the power duration model up to date and or uh, i i really uh think that your ftp protocol with the tte as well I, I think it makes a lot of sense but but it's not something i've implemented in my uh in my testing uh at at this point so so i just can't say for sure but i, I would assume so well one of the things that i've learned to do over the years is i assign some workouts that I know are going to positively affect the power duration curve in such a way that it will have an impact on the metrics. Um, Like for instance, if, uh, if somebody's doing a sweet spot workout uh, some, some of my pro athletes who have forever to train, like they'll do their efforts over the course of like a seven hour ride and that's fine. But uh, a lot of the time I'll be like, okay, you need to do five minute rests here because it impacts the power duration curve in the in the like 90 minute to two hour range a lot. And that's the kind of thing that affects the model. And so in those little bits of training where I'm, I give a, you know, one workout like this, that's when I'm like, okay, I know this is going to show an effect in the model. And that's the kind of stuff where we'll see TTE go out. 
and stuff like that. And, and so for me, uh, I think also, cause an advantage in cycling in general is that, you know, there's, there's almost never a bad time to have somebody go out and do a couple hard efforts, you know, in the one to, you know, eight minute range or something like that. And so I imagine as your athletes are getting close to their race, the last thing you want them to do is go out and blast a full five minute effort. Yep. (laughs) Even if you lose that point on the curve, you're like, well, (laughs) we're just gonna have to do without it for now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and and don't forget you have the swim and the bike and the run and they all impact each other. So, uh, so to me, uh, again, this is something, an evolution in my coaching over the last few years that, yeah, less and less, uh, looking at the metrics and, and more and more looking at what is the athlete actually doing in the workout. So for example, I might give a workout that is three to five times 20 minutes sweet foot intervals. And, um, uh, if the athlete does five times 20 minutes, if they choose to do that, they will tell me, it will tell me a lot of things. It will tell me about their psychology. It will tell me about their fatigue, but it will also tell me about their TTE, in my opinion, yeah. uh, to some extent, especially when, when I can compare that to, okay, you, I gave you the same prescription last week and you chose to do four. This week you did five. So, so those sorts of things also help to get to the same points. And, and I probably, I, I can't quantify things as exactly in with these methods, but I can uh, see that the trend is right and uh, and it can definitely help us see okay so what is realistic for you to do in the, to hold in the race uh, but but then the same method i can I, I can use those same methods and they work across the board in swimming biking and running whereas otherwise swimming and running are really a lot more difficult because we just don't have the accuracy of the power meter that we have on the bike so yeah. um so yeah that's that's a main reason for doing that Man, i can't believe how similar we are uh because you know, I, cause I've, I've also come upon the exact same way to track progress. And it's like, like if I didn't have WK5, I could still do it. You know, it's, yeah. it's not like, like, you know, quality training hinges on it. it's easier to analyze trends and data like that. It's a lot easier. It's easier to analyze like, you know, how somebody pedals and somebody preferred cadence and, you know, uh, you know, force velocity curve and sprinting and stuff like that. It's so much easier that way. But it's not indispensable. It's indispensable as a time saver for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think, I think my last try question specifically is, um, has the, you know, cause you know, I'm, I'm not an arrow expert. Um, sounds like you're not an arrow expert either, but you do have friends who are. And so do I. Yeah. Um, yeah. but do you think that the, the arrow arms race has hit triathlon already, or is it like really in, you know, cycling time trials for now and it's getting into triathlon? I think it's hit triathlon for sure. And, um, yeah, especially I think on the, the men's professional side, uh, it is extremely well developed. It's getting to the women's side as well. Uh, it's a bit more, uh, I would say varied, uh, on the women's professional side. But also on the age group side now, like you do have a lot of age groupers that are uh, really focusing on aerodynamics a lot more than than they used to, and and there is there's certainly a lot more awareness uh, on the amateur side, and and I think that we're maybe on the cusp of more and more people actually taking action on it and and really working on actively improving their aerodynamics, and and I think that will happen with. Uh, the tools that we have that are already useful uh, in certain contexts, uh, you have to know their limitations and uh, and so on. But they they are useful, and and as they get better and better, which I think they will, then then I think it will really hit triathlon big time. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I know I'm quite familiar with the the British time trialing scene, and and there you definitely have the amateurs as well that are extremely uh, knowledgeable about and good uh, good aerodynamically on the bike and I, th- I think in triathlon you have you maybe don't have the same depth of amateurs that are extremely extremely good at uh, aerodynamics but you have the top the the top uh amateurs they are definitely many of them anyway will have that same attribute and and on the pro men's side i really think it's it's top notch there uh for for the most part do you think it's it's more prevalent or actually, or let me put it this way: Is do you think it's less prevalent in draft legal triathlon? 
Oh, uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I think very few people in draft legal triathlon pay any attention to it. And I mean, it makes sense because um, they, for many athletes anyway, they know that they're not strong bikers. So their their plan is to hinge on being able to ride with the pack. Mm-hmm. So, but But I do know that this is again the norwegians uh, are a great example of that uh their game plan uh they being weaker swimmers is that they have to bridge up from that second swim group for example to the front pack and then start the run with the front pack and 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 to be able to do that um given that in the front pack you have the same issue that you have in all cycling and triathlon races potentially being aided by media uh, vehicles and so on mm-hmm. they have to be really damn fast uh, on the bike even in draft legal races or uh, so so they did put in a lot of focus i know uh, from for tokyo the tokyo olympics for example into even things like aerodynamics uh, in the draft legal race and and there are probably a handful of other uh, draft legal athletes that, that are doing those things but but it's I mean, it's understandably a lot less of a focus, but uh, but I think I think some athletes, depending on their strengths and weaknesses, could probably could stand to to actually focus on it, like the Norwegians showed, uh, could make a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that drafting has a large component on, especially in like shorter, you know, quote unquote shorter races on the track and running. Um, is that something that also happens in triathlon? Um, like I actually. I, I don't know if you're like not allowed to like run right behind somebody in triathlon because you know at some no, speeds, you are you are yeah because at some yeah, speeds, I would assume are. there is a draft benefit. Yeah, I mean when you look at the Olympic distance and sprint distance racing, uh, yeah, at the top level you have speeds above twenty kilometers an hour to to win those races. Mm-hmm. So so there you do have uh, a drafting benefit. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but it's uh, it's significant. So. So definitely, tactics play a part, and um, that's a good uh, a good comment and a good observation because I do think that maybe a lot of athletes uh, would maybe uh, benefit from thinking a bit more about that. Uh, you see it this year on the draft legal scene in the sprint and Olympic distance races that you have two standout athletes in Alex Yee from Great Britain and Hayden Wild from New Zealand that are that are uh, consistently battling it out out with each other and. Uh, Alex E coming from a track running background uh, has so far mostly gotten the better out of Hayden Wild and and he seems to be running more of the time behind Hayden and kind of hiding <laughs> and, and waiting for his time and and it has helped him so far when they reach the blue carpet and sprint for the line he has beaten him and it, 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 it's obviously one aspect of it is just he has a great sprint on him but but also could Hayden be more tactical and run behind Alex and and then maybe have more energy left for the sprint and and or maybe for a longer kick like a 400 or 800 meter kick towards the line so 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 I think at the top level those are the kinds of things that you need to focus on but in long distance triathlon when the the speeds are more in the um, I don't know 18 17 kilometer an hour even on the pro men side at, at the half distance then 80 kilometers an hour I, I guess it's uh, trying to do the, the conversion from pace to speed and and i'm not sure i'm getting it exactly right but it's what it's certainly a fair bit below 20 then uh i i think that it, it stops really having that much of an of an impact unless maybe if you're running into a strong headwind so so yeah in that sense uh in, in that context i don't think it makes too big a difference anymore but at, at the top level in the shorter draft legal races yeah it, it can it can have an impact uh, do, do you have more like slower age group athletes who have this as like a main focus on their training, um, where you're like, hold on, buddy, let's, let's get you finishing the race first. Like, is, do you have some people who like with, you know, who, who think about this kind of stuff a lot? Because in cycling, you know, I think a lot of people focus on the physiology, but there's also a very large camp of people who are always thinking about tactics and hiding and positioning and stuff like that. So um, where, where is triathlon with all that kind of stuff generally? Uh, that's a great question. I, 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 re- I think it varies a lot from individual to, to individual there. I, I have, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, I think most people that I coach anywhere are, uh, I, I, maybe it's just because we work together for quite a long time and, and we've already kind of, uh, talked through where they are currently, and, and we we have a 
an alignment around that and and there is a self-awareness in them so so i think yeah i don't have that where people talk about race tactics when they should be focusing about finishing the race really um yeah i think i think that there there is definitely a point where the faster age groupers for example and 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 the professional athletes where maybe uh, yeah yeah thinking about tactics isn't something that has really occurred to them especially in long distance racing because it's still such a long race that it's it's in a way it's an individual time trial uh but it's but it's also not uh you still have you you can still benefit from not racing it like a an evenly paced time trial so 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 i, I guess there is a little bit of i i would say that there there is there is a certain uh demographic of athletes that that maybe that that are not thinking about tactics when when they maybe should be but then again, at the very top of the sport, I, I do think that everybody is, is very tactically aware and, uh, and and it does play a big part as well in, in the racing and, and how it plays out the race dynamics and so on. That's that's fascinating to me. Um, and I think my very last question on all of this is going to be, uh, were was there a big uproar in the triathlon community about drafting in the two-hour marathon? not that i'm aware of no no i think i think they all actually it was a but but are you aware of the sub seven sub eight project that happened just this june no so that was the the triathlon equivalent of uh of the two-hour marathon where uh christian blumenfeld and uh and uh, joe skipper on the men's side and kat matthews and nicholas Pirig on the women's side uh each put together a team so there were four teams and uh, the men were trying to do an ironman in under seven hours and the women were trying to do it in under eight hours and they each got to have 10 people on their teams and they could distribute them how they wanted in uh, swimming, cycling and, and running as pacers. And on the bike, they were allowed to uh, to draft, which, of course, normally you're not allowed in an Ironman. Yeah. And so so it became like a team time trial on the bike. And the bike is obviously where most of the time gains were made. And uh, and I think there was a bit of a like there, there was definitely, uh, you know, uh, some people that that thought that well this is uh, not in the spirit of triathlon so so that there was an uproar there in the in that sense uh and uh, i would disagree with that i think it was it was a fun event it, it was a show it's it's not of course not a world record just like the two-hour marathon wasn't a world record and and to be honest the two-hour world two, the two sub two-hour marathon was obviously closer to the real thing than the sub seven sub eight because in in a race in a running race you are allowed to draft people which you are not in a triathlon race. So they did bend the rules a lot more in in the triathlon equivalent of the running. Uh, but uh, yeah, I didn't see anything for the, the sub two hour marathon in the triathlon community. No. Interesting. Um, yeah, because it's it sounds like, um, you know, it's not, it sounds like a bit like the UCI hour record, um, you know, because the rules have changed so much. Like, you know, a lot of people like I was so excited when Fabian Cancellara wanted to do the hour Merck's style with like box section rims on drop bars because uh, he wanted to compare himself to, you know, the greatest. Um, and, you know, it's gotten, you know, it's it's obviously to you know, re reinstill interest in the hour. They changed it so that aerodynamics can play a big part, you know, like. I cannot imagine like Dan Bigham's hour, he did more than like 380 watts or something like that. Um, but, you know, aerodynamically, he has, he is like on top of the world. And I think it's, you know, I, I think the question is really is like, I th- obviously this is something that everybody has to answer for themselves is, you know, is that in the spirit of the hour? Like, is that, yeah. is that fair play? That's a good question. I, I don't have an answer. Uh, and, and I'm, um, yeah, not not as familiar as uh, either with w- when different uh, rules changes have taken place. Place, so I'm I'm only, um, yeah, I, my 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 knowledge of the hour is 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 more recent than that. I guess like what what is allowed now and and how did them begin go about it? So so for me, but but I understand people that have seen uh, the way that it was done before, and yeah, obvious it, it's obvious that you want to compare. Okay, so what could the current heroes do compared to the heroes of old? And and when you're robbed of the chance to see that then yeah i can understand that that's uh yeah that's frustrating and, and you want things to stay the same in in that sense yeah well the uci is interesting because they're they're trying to 
regulate a certain amount of tradition in cycling, I think, because when we were watching like, you know, Obrey, like with the Superman position and that super tuck and all that, um, you know, like he's on that bike that's he made out of a washing machine. Um, you know, he's in this tiny little weird position. He's got these tiny little bars and he's tucked down like a ski jumper. Uh, and he's going so fast. Um, you know, like it was so radical compared to what had happened before. And, you know, like, cause the most radical thing that had happened before that was Greg Lamont put triathlete bars to win the, the tour time trial on the last stage by eight seconds. Um, and you know, I think it's, I, I'm all, I just, I always wonder about that because I don't have a good answer either. Um, cause cycling is a sport of tradition. Like we still do the same, like, you know, 15 big races in Europe that we've always done. And like the biggest new one is in Italy, go figure. Like I would love to see a really cool race in like Africa or South America where everybody goes and it's like a huge deal. Um, but yeah, you know, that is that tradition thing. Yeah, there is it, it, what triathlon is doing, uh, because things are changing a lot in triathlon right now with the introduction of the professional triathletes organization, which, uh, is backed by some, uh, really, uh, rich investors. So, so they have a lot of, a lot of money that they are using to try to grow the, the sport commercially through growing the professional side of it. Uh, to make a long story short, and, and they are introducing the so-called PTO Tour, uh, which this year had the first two uh, Opens, as they call them. So the US Open, well, that's to happen in September, and the Canadian Open already happened uh, in July, I believe. So And next year, they're going to do the European Open and the Asian Open. And I think in particular, the, in particular, the Asian one will be interesting because so far, triathlon has been so centric to Europe and North America. And uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see what sort of engagement that they can drum up uh, with the Asian one. There, to be fair, there there are uh, race there are race. It's not like there are not races in Asia. There there have been races there for a long time. Uh, Japan is actually there's uh, been a lot of good, especially short course Japanese athletes uh, over many many years, and they have a history of putting on races as well uh, at the highest level. Yokohama is uh, consistently on the World Triathlon Championship Series calendar, but. But it's uh, yeah on the long long course side of things uh, yeah it will be interesting to see where the the new Asian Open will will take things and and yeah I think I I can understand that in cycling as well it would be interesting to see what a new interesting race in an interesting place would do for the sport yeah um, and one more question on that because um, in uh, in cycling I think a lot more people would rather win the tour than they would rather. They would rather win the tour than an Olympic gold in the Olympic road race. Um, and I think that speaks to like the amount of tradition that's there. Uh, so where is the Kona Ironman versus the Olympics for triathlon? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, I think it's uh, more skewed in triathlon towards the Olympics than Kona, uh, or compared to cycling anyway, that the Olympics – I would see the Olympics as the most prestigious thing, partially because it happens only every four years. And and also, yeah, it's just crazy. The the times that they're running, I mean, uh, Kona is great. Uh, long distance travel is great, but it's more of a war of attrition. But compare that with when you see somebody running a 29-minute 10k after they've already swim and biked as hard as they possibly can. That that's just that's just crazy to me. Like it's it's incomprehensible. Um, so 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 I, and I think a lot of athletes would, especially the athletes that have grown up doing triathlon as kids, they they would certainly say the Olympics. Uh, athletes that have straddled both short and long distance triathlon would probably say the Olympics. But there is of course a lot of athletes that come straight into long distance triathlon and and then yeah they would say Kona. A lot of amateurs would say. Kona because they are adult onset triathletes. They started doing Ironmans and 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 they are more interested in in Kona, not all in the Olympics. So so it's not as if it's you know a clear oh the Olympics is bigger, but but I yeah I think it's it's a little bit maybe skewed towards that and 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 I think that maybe at least for me like what kind of determines that question is the athletes that have the opportunity to win both like Christian Blumenfeld. Um, 
won the 2021 Ironman World Championships, even though it was in St. George in 2022 because the Kona version was postponed mm. and it was moved. And uh, But now he has the chance to win Kona after winning the Olympics. But and I, he he has probably been asked this, but uh, and but I can't remember. And but I'm pretty sure that he would say that still the Olympics is the the one. If he could have only won one of those, the Ironman World Championships or the Olympics, I'm pretty sure he would say the Olympics. Yeah, because I think um, you know when it comes to that kind of stuff, I always wonder what's the um, you know because because uh, provenance also has a big part of it too, like. You know, when you if you win an Olympic medal, you are comparing yourself to everybody else who's won an Olympic medal. Like you know, throughout, you know, when was the first Olympics in the modern era? Like eight, late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, like nineteen oh six, maybe. Yeah, nineteen oh four or eighteen ninety six. I think one of them, um, maybe. But you know, too bad we don't have like records going back to the Greek times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> oh, they didn't have bikes back then. Oh, who cares? Um, so, um, but I always wonder because I think the tour is probably harder than the Olympics to in some ways, especially because it's, it's longer um, there, you know, there are larger team aspects, you know, your team better. Um, and I think also, I, I think who is it? Miguel and Durain once said that anybody can win the world championships because you just have to have one day, but winning the tour or any grand tour is harder because you have to have 21 good days. Hmm. Yeah. I, th- I think that's, that's a very very fair point and and he's he's probably right and and that's probably right that winning the tour is harder um uh, yeah if you have one bad day then uh that's it for you and we kind of saw it in this year's tour because Pogacar really only had one bad, bad day but that cost him in the end yeah and uh um yeah, in, I mean, in, in the triathlon comparison between Kona and the Olympics, it's different because they are both one day events. So, so I think that you don't really have that same aspect. I think, I think the Olympics is the one that is, there's no, absolutely no margin for error. Like if you ask Jan Frodeno, who has won, uh, the Olympics in 2008 and he won Kona, uh, three times in 2015 and 16 and 19 i think Mm -hmm. uh he he would say uh i'm pretty sure that only 2019 was that's when he had his perfect race in in kona but 2015 and 2016 there are things that he could have done better but in the olympics there's really there's no margin for error like you you have to have a perfect race uh almost certainly to to win because it's you're almost almost definitely going to be uh yeah to be together with other people until very close to the finish. So, um, yeah. So the shorter distance the margins are so small. makes it more exciting in a lot of ways. I mean, yeah, I'm, so I, my coaching bias is that I, I love coaching the long distance. I love training for and racing long distance, but, but as a spectator, I love the short distance. That's, that's what I'm the most drawn to. And so, yeah, I think, I think it makes it, I think the bike is honestly, they, they should do something about the bike because that's often very, very boring, uh, because <laughs> the packs just say the same that they are after the swim. And it's, it's almost impossible for a break to happen, uh, the way the courses are set up. They should have some more challenging courses, maybe less dead turns and so on. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the bike can be boring, but yeah, the swim and the run are, are super exciting and, so yeah, in, in, for for spectators, I think the, the short distance is is more exciting. Or that's something that the organizations like the PTO are trying to do something about making long distance more exciting for spectators and bringing more commercial value to it. And clearly, cycling is a great example of that because when you have people that are engaged for twenty one days of racing or many hours in the tour, then it's not that the duration is necessarily the problem, but that it's there's got to be something they can do to make it more exciting. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> somebody who makes like cycling more exciting is uh, <laughs> gonna make a lot of money. Um, what is your favorite meme? And uh, doesn't have to be training or cycling related. Just what's your favorite meme? Um, yeah, I'm I'm really bad at this, uh, <laughs> but I had one one that I saw uh, that was that was quite funny. It was um, some somebody comes in, a cyclist coming in from a ride, looking at his 
by computer or GPS watch or and telling his friend that uh, I, I rode 120 kilometers at 32 kilometers an hour at a power of 195.7 watts and a heart rate of 145. And then his friend asks, did you have fun? And uh, the guy looks at his watch and says, it, it doesn't say. <laughs> so that's, that's one that I like. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, but I, I can I can give you a bonus one, which is not a meme at all. But it's a it's a video, a six minute YouTube video. If if you search on YouTube for uh, Ultra Runner versus Iron Man, that's that's a really fun one. I, I think you will enjoy that one. Okay, cool. Um, do you have time for a couple listener questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have not seen these yet. I guarantee at least the first one is about peeing on the bike. Uh, so why don't we just get that out okay. of the way? Do triathletes pee yeah. on the bike, and does anybody actually care? Yes and no. Okay. Um, well, maybe some people care actually, but people, but yeah, triathletes do. They they don't care. Yeah. Up, oh, just like clockwork. First question: PP on the bike? Yes or no? Uh, <laughs> two, three, four. P questions. All right. Everybody who's checking out my Instagram needs to stop asking about P. Um, uh, somebody says. Um, Tell us more about your training camp in Mallorca. Yeah, uh, so it's uh, basically we're it's a pretty big training camp. We're going to have uh, uh, hopefully all of our coaches there, uh, so five of us, but at least we're going to have many coaches and uh, and uh, forty to fifty athletes. Hopefully, last year we were uh, mid thirties, and uh, and there's room for a few more this year. And uh, it's for all levels. We can we have the resources to split things into groups of different different levels we're going to uh be doing of course a lot of the famous climbs from Mallorca like Sakalobda and 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 exploring the different the great cycling opportunities that exist there it's a really beautiful island and, and the cycling there is brilliant roads are good uh drivers are respectful uh and there's also a, a pool on the right at the hotel facility so we're swimming in an outdoor pool at the hotel and and doing some swim video analysis, technical feedback, but also just good, good old fashioned hard work to to get everybody ready for the season. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's more information on the website scientifictriathlon.com. But in in a nutshell, that's that's what we're doing there. In the pool, is it like a typical hotel pool? Like there's a shallow end and there's a diving board. No, 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 <laughs> no. It's it's a tra- it's a training it's a training pool. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's there are also recreational pools, but uh, but most people don't use them in. March. It depends on the weather, I guess. Like we hopefully will have. Uh, to be honest, last year we had pretty bad weather uh, for unseasonally bad weather. But uh, it's the end of March, so so generally speaking, the weather should be really nice in, in Mallorca at that time of year. Um, why don't triathletes wear socks? Well, it's uh, faster to not put them on uh, in transition and uh, so most tri- for up to olympic distance uh, triathlon which is uh, 1500 meters swimming 40 kilometers biking and 10 kilometers running most triathletes uh, especially the faster ones don't wear socks for any any of it so also running barefoot when it comes to the half distance where the running goes up to 21 kilometers then a lot of athletes choose to put on socks but some choose not to do i've done both and uh, Sometimes successfully, uh, not put on socks. Sometimes you pay for it with a blister that takes some time to to go away, and you lose some training. But but if uh, in a race where fifteen seconds might mean a lot to you, then uh, it can still be worth it. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically saving time in in transitions. Interesting. I had never noticed that or even thought about it, but that makes a lot of sense. I would definitely go socks because I've. Uh, I, I just can't imagine the smell of your shoes if you don't wear socks and you go for a long run. Yeah, uh, no, it's it's pretty bad, <laughs> but you don't really notice it in a race when you're pumped full of adrenaline. So, so it's all right. Um, what's your favorite restaurant in Spain? In Spain, well, um, I live in Portugal, so should I answer Portugal? I can't answer Spa- I, I can't answer Spain as well because I've been there. Fair. Uh, how about how about Portugal and Mallorca? Portugal and Mallorca. Uh, well, Mallorca is definitely the buffet at the hotel we're staying during the camp. <laughs> that's that's a good buffet, and uh, 
and and in Portugal, uh, yeah, we have uh, a great local. Now uh, we have a great local restaurant uh, called Adega das Gravatas, which is uh, in a place in Lisbon where you will never have any tourists. It's only locals, and, and it's traditional Portuguese cuisine. It's not fancy. It's big portions. But it's very good quality, and uh, yeah, I like that. That sounds great. Uh, I'm down. I'm especially down for the buffet. Yeah. Uh, anything like I, I am, I can be swayed by volume. Um, uh, what's the difference in volume, uh, especially for endurance training in general between Ironman distance and sprint distance? At the elite level, um, the difference is not that big. Like the world's best sprint distance triathletes train 25 30 hours per week depends a little bit 20 to 30 some are more the lower volume athletes are maybe in the 20 to 24 hour range and the higher volume in the 26 to 30 hour range per week uh, in total and and for Ironman uh, honestly it's to say it's it's very much the same or maybe you would have a slightly higher skew in the Ironman athletes like uh, two to four hours more on average in an Ironman athlete than a sprint distance athlete if you take the let's say the top 50 in the world but but not not too big a difference uh, because yeah it it, uh, it turns out that you still need that volume to maximize your endurance adaptations also for a race that takes you let's say 50 minutes at the at the top end uh, but for an age grouper if you're looking to just uh complete then for a sprint distance race you you can train uh, you can easily do a sprint distance race generally with uh three to five hours per week four to five hours maybe uh, if you're just starting out and uh, and for an Ironman, if you want to, then I would definitely recommend building up to, you want to have a couple of kind of 14 hour weeks in there probably, but but that doesn't have to be the bulk of your program. The bulk of your, your you can definitely average around nine to 10 hours per week if it's your first Ironman and you have maybe done some shorter races before. Uh, so for the three months leading into the race, if you average nine, 10 hours per week and you have a, a few weeks of 14 hours per week, then that's, that I would say is, uh, with with the right training structure is is very much doable for completing your first Ironman. I'm I'm uh, you know I'm kind of fascinated by that because I would have given the same answer. Not that I know a ton about triathlon, but um, uh, I think that um, actually here let me ask you let me approach it this way. Um, how prevalent is it that people ask? Well, my race is only this long. Why do I have to do more training than that? Oh uh, yeah, it's it's quite prevalent. I I don't have any stats on it, but yeah, it, it does happen. <laughs> um, what are your tips on how to start running safely for cyclists? Yeah, you have to really give it time. I, I think, especially as a cyclist, a well-trained cyclist, uh, you have to be aware of the fact that your your cardiovascular and metabolic fitness is going to be way, way, way ahead of your uh, your tissue uh, resilience, your bones and tendons and ligaments, and and those things. And also, even if you're starting from not being, you know, a world beater on the bike, uh, those cardiovascular and metabolic adaptations come a lot quicker especially the cardiovascular ones i would say than than the tissue adaptations that's something that takes a, a much longer amount of time so so progress much slower than you think you should be progressing <laughs> that's 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 the best answer that i can give you um i i think yeah it's it, it depends on if you've done any running before or any weight bearing sport like some having some done some resistance training can can help because then you have maybe some higher bone mineral density and and, and tissue strength than than if you're a complete newbie to any sort of load bearing um so yeah i don't i don't want to generalize around volumes but yeah there's nothing wrong with starting with doing three runs a week of 10 to 15 minutes doing that for a couple of weeks and maybe add five minutes to to each of those runs for a couple of weeks and then take a week where you maybe don't run at all or just do a couple of 10 minutes runs and and like really it it, it has it's it's always better to be too careful than to progress too quickly because that can potentially derail you not just from running but also from cycling if you get a running injury i i think it's very telling that in triathletes they tend to find it when they do studies on on the subject that 80 percent of triathlon injuries uh 
come from running. That might be 80% of overuse injuries. I'm not sure if traumatic injuries are included in that, but but that's still the lion's share. And it's not like as if you're as if there are no overuse injuries on the bike or the swim both of them you you see cyclists have overuse injuries and swimmers have overuse injuries but but it's just that running is so much so much more riskful in terms of overuse injuries yeah um i mean because and especially when somebody like you know goes faster than you tell them to um i was uh hmm. i was training somebody in running because he you know was just going to do like a 5k or something um and when I, when I was trying to bring the pace up just a little bit with him, like, you know, jog and then, you know, a minute every five minutes, go a little faster uh, at whatever pace, um, he was like sprinting. And I yeah. was like, don't do this. You are going to get shin splints. And so like, I was like, all right, well, we got to do some race pace kind of stuff. Don't sprint. Shin splints. So yeah. Yeah. That a lot. Yeah. I think, I, think, I think another thing is that when – even things like shoe selection for your running gait. I mean, that's not that's not to say that uh, th- th- that that that's the thing that I get asked a lot, actually, especially by by my athletes sometimes. Like, should I I have this opportunity to go and do a running gait analysis and get some correction tips? And generally speaking, my advice is that no, you shouldn't do that. Your body will uh, already be well adapted to your running style, and and it will have found the most efficient way for you to run. There are definitely uh, certain cases where you might want to do some technical changes but for most people that at least have been running then technique takes takes care of itself but at the same time like if you're completely new to running you're not really you don't really know what you're doing you might uh, you might find that you have to experiment with finding the right shoes and so on that that will be have the right amount of cushioning and support for you and for your running style and and while you do those sorts of find those sorts of lessons basically and learnings then yeah it's better to be conservative to to not risk anything and anything happening in the meantime yeah and then when you're more experienced if it ain't broke don't fix it yeah exactly uh okay last question um you're amazingly impartial on the podcast what training concept do you most disagree with what training concept do i most disagree with um Oh, uh, yeah, I need some time to think about this. <laughs> I'll start. I mean, I faster mean, training. I, yeah. Hey, faster, faster training, training. Yeah. That's a, that's a fast. Yeah. Faster training is probably, that's probably the one I would say, because honestly, that's, yeah, I, I haven't, I, and I have experimented with that as a coach and I've never seen that translated to performance and, and yeah, all the other things that I can think of, <laughs> I can think of examples when, when even though I don't agree with it, it, it does work. But fast training, I think <laughs> everything points towards not doing it. So, so I, I, I think that that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, all right, Is, uh, do you have any more thoughts uh, to share or anything that you wanted to bring up that we didn't quite get to? Um. No, I think I think we covered a lot here. Uh, I just want to thank you for all the work you put into your podcast because it's uh, uh, yeah I'm a very loyal listener of of it and uh, and I think it's uh, it's un- it's a unique podcast that you have and uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you. I I, I holy fuck I'm blushing. Um, <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, and you know you like your podcast continues to be my favorite training podcast. Uh, you know, partly because, you know, you do have such good impartial questions. And I think, you know, uh, you know, you and I have such a, a, a similar mindset when it comes to training and coaching. And, um, and, you know, when you, the first time you reached out to me to be on your podcast, my first thought was, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, man. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, I hope people appreciate this. And I will uh, leave all the links in our show notes about where they can find you. But I'm sure most of uh, my listeners already listen to your podcast. So um, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, great. Thank you for having me. 
I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As I said at the top of the show, be sure to check out the Empirical Cycling podcast and also to follow Coley on Instagram at Empirical Cycling where he does fantastic weekend AMAs in his stories. I really love reading them every single weekend. It's uh, it's really uh, a good time and he has really good answers to the questions that come up. Uh, as always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com with links to Coley's website, podcast, Instagram, uh, a couple of articles and resources mentioned, uh, the Ultra Runner versus Iron Man YouTube video which is a fun, silly YouTube video if you want to spend a few minutes hopefully laughing. Hopefully it's not just me that thinks that it's funny. Also, some of the guests that I mentioned that had a big impact on the podcast or that I thought had a big impact on me, I should say, as an interviewer that I really thought were breakthrough interviews or really big guests to get onto the podcast i have linked to all of those in the description as well so if you haven't listened to them then uh, they are there in the archives for you to check out i want to uh give a reminder about our training camp we have coming up uh, i should also say that i am recording this outro uh quite far in advance of releasing the episode about a month or so ahead so uh i can't guarantee especially for the algarve training camp that we have any slots left when you hear this but for the mallorca camp we most likely have uh quite a few slots left still because there's uh quite a bit of time still to go until then but basically uh, check out all of the information on scientifictriathlon.com about our training camps but in short Mallorca is our flagship training camp in at the end of March uh, we will have uh, lots of athletes and coaches there uh, open for a wide range of abilities and we will do the famous Mallorcan climbs like Cyclobda we'll stay at a great hotel that's catering uh, to triathletes and cyclists and in the Algarve, it will be a bit more of a small group affair with 15 advanced athletes that are looking to build a really serious foundation for a year of racing ahead. This camp is at the end of January, uh, so it's a bit earlier in the year. It's definitely more of a chop wood and carry water camp. But if you are really serious about uh, getting off to a great start to the year, building a great foundation, learning a lot, doing some testing and video analysis and so on, then come to this camp uh, as we will be training in a very small group. There will also be uh, a really great chance of getting to know uh, us coaches and the other athletes really really well so i think we'll have a great time in at that camp as well as the mallorca camp next monday's guest is to be determined at the time of this recording uh, but subscribe to the podcast if you aren't already and you'll of course get every episode downloaded to your podcast app as soon as they are released and you won't miss any single episode finally big thanks to our sponsors precision fuel and hydration that you can find on precisionfuelandhydration.com use their free fuel and hydration planner to understand your fluid electrolyte and carbohydrate needs and get a specific and effective race strategy and book a free video consultation with the, te- with the team if you want to refine it further use the code tts22 at checkout for 15 percent off your first order of fueling and hydration products and thank you to roca that you can find on roca.com check out their wetsuits tri suits swim skins goggles and exceptional sunglasses and prescription glasses for everything from day-to-day wear to extreme action sports use the promo code that you can get on roca.com for slash tts to get 20 percent off your entire roca order thank you as always for listening keep training smart and keep loving triathlon